Hi everyone and welcome back to Thursdev. I'm your host Luke and today marks the first day of year two here at Level Zero NPCs. To kick it all off, we're going to start a quick talk about digital rights management, the boogeyman of gaming. It pops up in gaming forums every once in a while and I find that there's a whole lot of misunderstanding about what DRM actually is and how it works, and when it can actually even help us as game consumers. So I thought I'd try my best to explain what it is in simple terms. What is it, first of all? The problem with DRM is that it's a blanket term for a lot of things. Generally speaking, when people talk about DRM, the first thing that pops into mind is a system that prevents players from accessing a piece of software in one way or another without first verifying that it's a legitimate copy of that software. Those of us that grew up in the age of DRM's infancy probably remember things like Star Force, a system that was so egregious in its implementation of DRM that it led to widespread boycott of developers that made use of the solution at all. DRM can be anything from encrypted data within a file that makes it unreadable without verification, or it can be logging into a server in a game to authenticate your personal details and maintain persistent player data. Its uses, implementation, and even function is very broad, which is why talking about it requires a little bit of qualification. Of course, I'll be talking about DRM in video games, which is perhaps one of the places where it's most at home. But just know that a lot of the things that I'll be talking about today are also transferable to other forms of DRM. Digital Rights talks about a system of checking whether a particular accessor of a piece of data has the right or entitlement to access that data, in simplest terms. DRM in games traces its roots all the way back to early copy protection, which was a primitive system of discouraging pirated copies of software by asking the player to reference a specific part of the software manual or use a code wheel to find a specific number to input. A well-intentioned system, but easily exploited if you had access to so much as a photocopier. Copy protection eventually evolved into what's most commonly remembered as product keys or software keys, which are long strings of letters and numbers, usually input during installation, which an internal verification system within the software could check against a hash companion number. If the string returned the correct hashed value upon running it through an encrypted algorithm, matching the value expected, the software assumes that it's a legitimate copy and moves on. Software pirates, ever industrious, were extremely good at working out these algorithms, and there were usually five key generators for every game on the market within days of its release. The key algorithms were improved, the pirates improved. The executable started to look for an encrypted packet of data on a disk in the disk drive, pirates cracked the executable in order to ignore the check and always return a positive. This push-pull persists to present day, but it has also driven the growth and ultimately the change, in many ways for the better, of modern DRM. CD copy protection, limited installs, zealous anti-cheat programs, all of these are examples of DRM that has done a fine job coloring our perception of the practice of implementing these systems, to the point that now, in the online age where DRM has matured significantly and there are situations where DRM is a necessity, it can still lead to anger, vitriol, and gross misunderstandings of the inner workings of software. At its core, modern digital rights management is still for all intents and purposes designed as a method of verifying that software being run is being run by a person that owns it legitimately. It was built to function originally much in the same way as copy protection, product keys, CD checks, and so on always have. At the time of its inception, it was during a brief era where software piracy was really at its peak. The era of Napster, WinMX, LimeWire, and Kazaa saw a massive influx of consumer software peer-to-peer -peer sharing, and one of the largest products on the market was, aside from music, computer games. During this time period, software was by and large still being distributed as physical media. CD-ROMs were king, and physical runs of discs were limited, and often expensive due to a highly controlled system of supply and demand, never mind if you lived in a different country. Sometimes a consumer would have no access to the game or simply didn't want to pay for it, and in some cases the copy protection was so overzealous that games would be less functional due to the barrier to entry, and a cracked version was simply superior, but ultimately the end result is that the player would get a pirated version of a game. Entirely client-based copy protections had failed to protect software from illegal copying, and it had also failed in that it provided a diminished or frustrating experience for the end user. Something had to change, and the most effective form of system that anyone managed to find was a form of online authentication that we now commonly refer to as DRM. 
Modern DRM uses a system that's very similar in many ways to product keys. Almost identical in fact, except for the major differentiating feature that authentication is not handled on the client side, as is the case with some older software key systems, but by connecting to an authentication server and verifying that the software is legitimate. Sometimes this check is performed once, sometimes it's persistent like with the much bemoaned Uplay service, but regardless of its frequency, it requires online connectivity. Some will argue against DRM that requires online connectivity because of bad internet connections, travel, and so on, but as the cellular age matures, these concerns are becoming less and less prominent. A confession. I was a pirate. A rampant pirate. I did buy some games, certainly. I still own my copies of Baldur's Gate 2 and Planescape Torment, Monkey Islands 1 through 3, and many others, but any game that I wasn't absolutely sure about, piracy was the new demo. I had Game Copy World open in my browser as often as MySpace, and I was pretty good at finding working copies of games through peer-to-peer -peer networks that I listed above. I even made a convert of some legitimate gamers, tempting them with the siren song of free video games. I was a bad gamer, to be sure. But the game that defeated me and perhaps put me on the right path was Half-Life 2. None of my cracks worked. The online authentication was just too good for me. I spent an infuriating weekend trying to unsuccessfully circumvent their DRM and it foiled me at every turn. Surprisingly to me, when I did more research into their DRM, something funny happened. You see, a shining example of heavy-handed but generally speaking done right DRM is the video game distribution platform Steam. Released in 2003 and seeing its first major influx of users corresponding with the sale of Half-Life 2, it was one of the first digital marketplaces. The savvy customer already realizes that Steam is a vehicle for DRM, but let me explain what that means. In order to access your library of games, you load up Steam. It serves as a one-stop platform for everything you could possibly need to do when wanting to play a game. It manages your game library for you, automatically patches games, and is a digital marketplace where, from the comfort of your own home, you can purchase games to your heart's content. It's also a required component of the vast majority of its products. Attempt to load a game from its executable with Steam is unconnected. The game will launch Steam first, log into your account, authenticate the game against its own product licenses, and then launch the game for you. Attempt to do so while your internet connection is unexpectedly disconnected, and you lose access to most of your content. It has an offline mode, but you have to be in online mode to turn on offline mode. What keeps this from being completely impalatable to the average consumer, however, is that it's ubiquitous. If you're a PC gamer, you likely already use Steam. Odds are, with its extremely small memory footprint, you also don't feel overly compelled to log out of the service. For the average Steam gamer, the DRM aspect of Steam is practically invisible. And then invisibility is its greatest strength. Yes, it has detractors, but it's so cleanly streamlined PC gaming that it even managed to reform a number of dyed-in-the-wool game pirates like myself. When I broke down and bought the orange box, or perhaps received it as a gift, I can't really recall now since it was 11 years ago, it struck me how painless the process was. No disk, no patches to download, I didn't even have to muck about in the depths of my folder hierarchy. It just worked. Steam is easy and cheap, and that was as effective at breaking piracy for me as the DRM itself was. But not every platform has worked out quite as smoothly as Valve's. There have been some snafus in the road to proper implementation. Remember when I mentioned Uplay a moment ago? Let's talk about Assassin's Creed 2. If you play video games, odds are that you're at least familiar with the Assassin's Creed series of games. It's not got quite the player base of a Call of Duty or a Battlefield, but this sequel to Ubisoft's flagship product, and arguably the most popular in its franchise, caused an enormous controversy for having had been always online. Prior to its release, the announcement that it would be online only had been made, with the additional gaffe that it was going to also require the Uplay service be running in parallel. If the online connection was severed at any time during play, the game would close. If Uplay was closed, the game would close. If the game was to employ any online connectivity, this would have been understandable at the very least, but the game was for all intents and purposes single player. Later entries into the series would include online functions, but not this one, and this talk of a single player game that required you to be online and connected to a proprietary second marketplace, even if the product was purchased through Steam, was, to put it gently, disastrous. Uplay was a mess. 
It continues to be a mess in my own anecdotal experience, but back at the time of the launch of Assassin's Creed 2, Uplay had connectivity issues, poor UX, at times it refused to launch or authenticate a user's login, and all of this was exacerbated as Ubisoft was subject to a distributed denial of service or DDoS attack in protest on the day of Assassin's Creed 2's launch, preventing players from accessing the game at all on its street date. It was a reactionary tactic by people against the concept of an always online DRM, and though it was certainly a dick move, it did send a message. People don't want access to their game to be contingent on whether they're connected to the internet or not. And why should they? If a game is single player and doesn't have any deeply integrated multiplayer functions, there's really no practical need for persistent online connectivity, except for as an anti-piracy measure. Good Old Games, now GOG, espouses a policy of DRM freedom in the games it distributes, with a policy of if you paid money for it, it's yours. Each game you purchase through GOG is presented as a downloadable backup installer that includes the entire product without any DRM included. This has done wonders to ingratiate Speedy Project with the gaming public, but even in these GOG games, which have proven with the advancement of distribution platforms making convenience the winner over piracy, there is still no truly full escaping DRM. Anti-piracy is certainly a function of DRM, but in a market where increasingly more games legitimately require online connectivity to function, like MMOs, competitive shooters, MOBAs and more, there's a point where DRM itself becomes an inextricable part of the game itself. For any game with online multiplayer, there's most commonly going to be an intermediary server that your game communicates with. The player transmits their inputs to the server, and the server has to validate with the client and communicate the appropriate actions to any other players nearby. This alone wouldn't be a problem and is entirely accomplishable without DRM, but consider your game of Overwatch if you have one. You have an account, your Battle.net account, which stores your playtime, metrics, accumulated gold, which skins you do and don't have unlocked, voice lines, everything. It has a name for you that it displays to other players. These are all contingent upon connecting to this server and storing that information. And without that login component, and without the server validating your account, anyone could be you in that game. Ruin your score, spend your coins, be a massive dick wearing your face. By locking that away behind a username and a password, your personal information is safe, as is your selected spray. It also ensures that the data being transmitted is valid. Though some sophisticated systems will still manage to circumvent it, without this server communication which requires authenticating your game against others, it would mean any amount of cheating, hacking, or game breaking could happen, and believe me, it would. Are there ways around it? Sure. Entirely peer-to-peer -peer games with no persistent where everybody has carte blanche to cheat are possible. Co-op doesn't strictly require DRM, and there are plenty of co-op multiplayer games that don't require it. But it's still worth mentioning that any competitive game where there's meant to be any kind of persistence or fairness will want authorization. Which for better or worse is DRM. I understand disliking DRM. It's a system whose primary function for the first large part of its history was to prevent unauthorized users from playing a game. And though many are able to reconcile piracy in their minds, most wouldn't openly admit that they think that piracy, regardless of an alternative, is good, unless they really don't give a shit about the people developing the games they pirate. But DRM serves a purpose. It's a padlock. You can put it on a door to keep people out that don't have a key, or you can put it on a door to keep the things inside safe. It has a very real and important place in some parts of our games, and that should be acknowledged even if we reserve the right to dislike it in general. As long as you enjoy your online competitive games, you should reconcile that because there's no alternative. If you can't, then be sure to buy your games from GOG and make sure that they're all single player. That's it for me today. I hope that you enjoyed this episode and that you'll consider subscribing and leaving a thumbs up or a thumbs down and a comment below. DRM is polarizing and it's a bit of a touchy subject at the best of times, but if you have thoughts about DRM, I'd love to hear them. Regardless, however, I'd like to thank you for watching as always, and I hope that I'll see you again here soon. Take care.